Hi folks, welcome to a video on speeds and feeds. Let's cover four things in this video. Number one, some starting recipes. Number two, let's talk about how to calculate the basics of feeds and speeds if you want to move beyond those starting recipes. Number three, let's talk about some tips and tricks on how to use different materials and how to use different size tools. And the number four, really important, chip thinning and how to calculate horsepower. Even if you're new to machining, I want you to understand the basics of this. I love making stuff, but having good feeds and speeds makes it so much more fun to make your parts. Welcome to another Wednesday widget. Starting recipes, these contemplate using a Tormach milling machine in either aluminum or steel. We've included a link to the end mill that I would like you to buy. You're welcome to use whatever you want, but the speeds and feeds here contemplate this three flute lake shore. I recommend using the TTS set screw style holder as you see right here. Some tips, you don't need the Weldon flat. That's a flat spot that's ground that's designed to mate up with the set screw. That's important for higher horsepower machines. It's not important for a quarter inch tool in the Tormach. We've never had one turn on us. We find that the set screw holders are actually better to use generally. They're easier to use. They're a little bit more rigid than ER collets. That's not to say ER collets aren't great and they have their purpose, but my go-to is the set screw. Choke up on your tool. You're purchasing this tool. It's got a shank section and then a flute section. When you insert that tool and tighten it, I want it choked all the way up so that the only portion extending beyond is the flute. Now, obviously, if you've got to reach in deeper, you can extend it, but be careful. You sacrifice a lot of rigidity when you do that. One of the things I recommend doing is take that Tormach set screw holder and replace the set screw. That's the only thing I don't like on them with uh, a quarter 28 or for the larger set screw holders, a 3 8 24 McMaster part numbers are included here. Much easier and much more reliable to use and not have that thread strip out. And then FYI, this tool from Lakeshore has a three thousandths or so radius ground on the very corner of the tip of the flute. And what that does is it reduces the weakest portion of the tool. It's the most likely uh, to break first. And when it breaks, it causes this kind of downward spiral where the next flute then sees uh, additional material and additional load, and it will then fracture and chip. And it can result in harmonics and, and finishes and chatter and so forth. Your starting depth of cut, quarter inch, that's 100% of the tool diameter. Your starting width of cut, 20% or 0.05 inches. If you're using Fusion 360, the adaptive strategies call this optimal load. If you're new to machining, you may think in RPMs and inches per minute, and that's okay. In this case, 5,100 RPMs, 15.3 inches per minute, but I want you to start understanding service feet per minute which is 334, an inch per tooth or IPT of 1,000. We're gonna talk about that more in a second here. I'll also discourage you from going less than 1,000th of an inch per tooth and absolute minimum is 5 tenths. Again, we'll come back to that with chip thinning. For steel, basically the same thing. A different tool happens to be five flute. Ironically, uh, about the same inches per minute, but it's a different recipe we're having a lower RPMs, but because it has five flutes instead of three, we actually go about the same speed or in inches per minute to maintain that chip load. Same starting depth of cut and width of cut. What I like about this is you're not going to break tools. You're not gonna wear those tools out because you're rubbing. Rubbing happens when you don't take enough uh, cut with a tool. Think of it like a backhoe or an excavator. That bucket wants to reach out. It wants to scoop in that soil and take a cut. Too many folks burn out tools because they think they're just going to take very light skim cuts and you burnish. You don't let that leading edge of the flute actually dig in and cut material away. If you want to move beyond this, you've got a different size tool, a different size material. I recommend using the feeds and speeds tab here. These two boxes the exact same information, it's just the way you input it. So in uh, the way we run Excel files is blue uh, or yellow and blue cells are input cells. 
So in the buy surface feet per minute, you would input the SFM. That's very useful because many tooling companies will not give you RPM, they'll only give you SFM. So we put in the diameter, let's say it's a 375 tool, we wanna to run two thousandths per tooth and it's three flutes. So if I were in steel, I would start out lower, like this uh, 100 surface feet a minute, 1000 RPMs. But if I'm in aluminum, I'd go a little bit higher, say 250 or even 300. What's important is the ratio between the RPM and the inches per minute, because that's what maintains this ever important inch per tooth thing, again, so that you're not rubbing. If you'd rather use RPM, same information here. Depth of cut, you can go up to 200% of the tool diameter. So that's gonna show the want to cut with more depth of cut and a thinner width of cut. And that has a ton of benefits that we'll get into in future videos. Some exceptions. Anything smaller than one eighth of an inch starts to get into micro machining. Really micro machining would be smaller than say 50 thousandths of an inch, but the different rules apply. You've got to maintain good chip evacuation. And sometimes, and this is crazy, you will violate that inch per tooth rule that I talk so much about. My recommendation is Harvey Tool. They've got some great information. They've got some great tools and they've got some really good technical information and speeds and feeds on micro machining. Shear hog is one of our favorite tools. That tool, our recipe is 0.2 inch width of cut, 0.2 inch depth of cut. As a general rule, the more flutes you have in a tool, the stronger that tool is because it has a thicker core. And what's great is because we're doing a thinner width of cut, the chip that forms when we cut more naturally flows and fits inside of what's called the gullet. That's the area between the outside of the flute and the core of the tool. One of the reasons that rooster tail works is those long thin chips fit so well and evacuate so well. If you're new to machining or new to a machine uh, with steel, I would go a lower RPMs and with aluminum, I would go higher RPMs or surface footage. Keep that chip load. I say one thousandth of an inch per tooth here. I'm probably gonna even revise that to be uh, 1.5 thou or even two thou per tooth. Speeds and feeds are, are easy for the most part. What is difficult is optimizing them. But I highly encourage you start with a recipe that works. And by that, I mean you don't want chatter. It's never okay to ch have chatter. And one of the problems with chatter is it can quickly compromise the tool, which means further testing will be compromised itself because you may have a tool that has a cracked edge or micro cracking or other problems with it. Start with something that works, work your way up. That could be frustrating because let's say I have to run a half inch tool with four flutes and I'm gonna take it easy, so something super low, 75 surface feet per minute, that's only 573 RPMs, 4.6 inches per minute. Most of us want to go faster than that. Start somewhere that works, build your way up. As you're building up a recipe, it can be really useful to know something called the material removal rate. That's the cubic inches of material that you're removing, because that can be helpful to know as you change a recipe, is it actually a more efficient recipe? Is it removing more material? We've created a formula here. It's quite simple. It's inches per minute times width of cut times depth of cut. And that gives you that cubic inches. That's also the key input for understanding how to calculate horsepower. Now horsepower is a really tricky thing. And the two big caveats are what's the material you're cutting and the specifics of that material. And we're talking about horsepower here at the cutter, and that's going to be different than the motor rating of the horsepower on your machine because there are losses that happen through gears and belts and pulleys and so forth. What we've done though is we've started to build out the basics of how to look at horsepower. It's this thing called K-factor. If you look down here in the Excel file tab, K-factor detail, We've imported this list of all of these materials along with their corresponding K-factor and Brunel hardness. And it's fun to see then this is what drives most of the speeds and fees calculators out there. And it's actually pretty simple. What's frustrating is it can vary greatly. So we'll take a very common material, 6061 aluminum. What's important is making sure the Brunel hardness matches. Now, if you're not sure, you want to check, McMaster tends to be a pretty good way to do that. If I go to aluminum, click on sheets and bars, and then expand this about aluminum, you'll be able to see, if we look at 
multi-purpose 6061 actually they give me the exact Brunel hardness I'm looking for sometimes you may need to compare that between a Rockwell B or C scale which is a different hardness rating to get an idea of what you're looking for if you don't find the exact material or you're not sure I would emphasize matching the Brunel hardness worry more about that and less about the specific nomenclature or perhaps some of the even branded uh, names behind some of these types of steels and alloys so when we've got that K factor the horsepower formula is really simple. It's simply the material removal rate divided by that K factor. So I've got them linked in here if you're familiar with Excel. And if not, you can just go click on the detail and say, uh, let's say 8620, 1.69 K factor. So we could manually type something in here and just say 8620 and 1.69. And we can see uh, that gives us the horsepower rating of 0.3, not very much. But let's say we bumped it up. 0.5 inch depth of cut, 0.1 inch width of cut. Now all of a sudden we're removing two cubic inches and that's gonna take 1.2 horsepower. That's really useful to understanding when you're gonna start pushing the limit of your machine, um, but also understanding the limitation of things like the work holding and how secure is the setup. For our friends in the rest of the world, we've also got the same information in metric. Lastly, I wanna talk about something called chip thinning. And please do not close the video now. This is awesome stuff and it's really important. What the heck is chip thinning? I think Dartmouth CNC did a great job posting this information here on his Instagram channel. When we program that feed rate of one thousandth of an inch per tooth, again, the idea there is that as we rotate that tool and as we move it forward through the cut, each flute will be cutting with a starting thickness of one thousandth of an inch. So you can see that in this picture here, the green area. Well, what happens is that that only works, that's only correct if we were cutting with a 50% step over. We don't do that. I just told you with most of our modern cutting recipes, we're gonna do something like 0.05, which is about 20% of the tool's diameter. This is basically old news, this whole 50% step over stuff. So when you do that, take a look at the right hand one, your chip thickness is reduced. The Sandvik technical guide, we'll put a link in the video description, I think also does a great job showing that. If we were at 50% step over, which we will never do, it would be this FZ, this width right here. But because we're cutting with less radial engagement, it's this reduced value, they call it HEX or HEX. And I know it's so easy to get complicated here, but again, I want you to look at this picture because remember when I was mentioning the backhoe example? That's what's so important. When we cut, this is creating a thick to thin chip. And I want you all to watch this video here. We'll put a card in it as well as a link in the video description. It's only two minutes, but if you're pressed for time, just start at 40 seconds. Sandvik explains why it's so important to create a thick chip when you start and going out to thin. The two things that really resonated with me, number one, again, is that insert or flute starts the cut. It needs to be able to dig in. If it started on a thin side, it would rub before it actually dug in. The second thing is that as you exit that cut, because it's now thinned out, you're less likely to tear the material or crack the workpiece even on a micro level. So what the heck does all this mean for you? Why should you even care? So there's this formula that looks complicated. It's not too bad. And we put it into Excel. So take our typical example here, quarter inch tool, 20% step over, 1,000th of an inch programmed. What's our actual? Our actual is 8 tenths. So believe it or not, when we're at 20% width of cut, which again is what I'm giving you in our starting recipe, even though I told you to run 1,000th of an inch per tooth, and that's what you're going to do at the 15.3 inches per minute, it's not actually 1,000th of an inch per tooth. It ends up being a little bit less than that. How much less? Not much, about 2 tenths. So here, I'm not too worried. Here's where this really matters. How many of you out there, myself included, when you're programming your parts in your cam, will do a small radial stock to leave, say 1,000th of an inch? Or how many of you in a 2D contour will do multiple finishing passes or repeat finishing passes or a spring pass? And when you do that, you end up cutting with only a radial step over of about 1,000th of an inch. And what happens there is your 
actual cut is only about 1.3 tenths. In many situations, that width of cut or this teal blue area here is less than the sharp edge of your cutting tool. The sharpest knife, the sharpest razor still has some bluntness to that edge. And in fact, a lot of tools are made a slightly honed edge to increase strength and, and tool life. And when you cut with a actual chip load that's less than that sharp edge, you will rub. So let's take a look. This is our go-to recipe. Our quarter inch tool to 20% step over one thousandth of an inch per tooth. You can see here we're making a real chip. Yeah, it happens to be calculated as eight tenths instead of one thousandth of an inch, but no big deal. That chip clearly is something that's being sheared away from the material. I like it. Take a look at this though. This is now a one thousandth of an inch spring pass or finishing pass on that same part. Look at how those chips. Now I'm okay with this. I was really excited to do this test. This is still a chip. It's really small and it's really thin, but there's still a continuous chip. It's just thinner. We're right on the edge. I'm actually excited to do some more testing because I think pretty quickly with a thinner engagement, this is going to turn into pixie dust and it's going to result in bur true burnishing. Here we're still cutting, but it's close. This is so important because aluminum is pretty forgiving. It's pretty easy on tools and your aluminum end mills tend to be sharper, which means they're more resistant to chip thinning. But two of the videos we have coming up are on 304 stainless and on cutting hardened A2 tool steel. And when we do those harder materials that are less forgiving and we've got to be more aware of this. So we put this graph together. What does this show? Well, remember here how I've got this ability to input, and let's say when we're at our standard cut of 50 thousandths at a 1,000th one of an inch per flute programmed feed rate, our actual feed rate is about 8 tenths. But if we say drop down to a 1,000 radial step over and a 1,000 programmed, we're only at 1 tenth. This graph plots out what that actual output value is as we decrease our radial engagement. So the first value all the way here on the left assumes that we were at 50% step over. So 0.125 inches for a quarter inch tool. And at that point, our programmed feed rate of 0.001 matches the actual feed rate of 0.001, just like we saw in the Sandvik graph. But as we decrease that radial engagement, the actual feed rate diverges from the programmed feed rate. And what we've been told by Thule manufacturers is again, that magic number you want to avoid is going under half a thousandth or five tenths per flute. But our job as machinists is to make sure the actual chip per tooth stays above that sort of no-go zone. So what I like about this is we've just added this red bar, which I can move around anywhere. But what I care about is where does my actual IPT this blue curve intersect with the 0.005 that I don't want to go below. So it's about right there. So if I drag this bar over, this is kind of look, looks like if my programmed feed rate was 1,000th of an inch per tooth, I cannot go below a 17,000 radial cut or step over. So let's take a look and see if that matches up with the formula up here. If I sit, we're at 1,000th of an inch programmed, Radial step over of 0 0.017. Sure enough, that's right at 5 tenths. So you wouldn't want to go say 0 0.01 because now we're underneath that value. So let's say you're doing a 5 thou radial finishing pass. That's only 2 or 3 tenths. That's too little per the rules I'm telling you to follow. What do you do? Pretty simple. All you've got to do is increase your programmed feed rate. So we'll change it from 1,000th of an inch to two thousandths of an inch. And that alone was enough to increase the actual to above that magic number. Again, go watch that Sandvik video, folks. We've got a ton of information coming. In fact, we're just about to launch a new website focused on everything regarding learning CNC, learning Fusion 360, learning speeds and feeds, more information on specific materials and specific tools. Folks, I love doing this stuff. Thanks for watching. Take care, see you soon.